Well, good morning. <laughs> Folks making their way in, so glad that you're here today. We've got a few announcements that we need to make you aware of. Um, Brother Gary is on vacation for, uh, I think the last time I heard he was somewhere heading toward the Smoky Mountains, so uh, we wish them a good vacation, time of rest. Uh, a couple of announcements. First off, use the bulletin. It's our communication guy that tells all that's going on in our church family. But I do want to make a couple of uh, particular uh, emphases on a couple of things. We will not have our evening worship this evening. We are in preparation and setting up for the fall festival. So if you're been involved in the fall festival, you know who you are. Uh, we're, we're setting the, the, the rooms up and the tour for next Saturday, so they'll be going on this evening. There will not be any evening worship service. Um, the Wednesday night meal this week, October 23rd, will not be in the fellowship hall. It will be in here. All right? Everybody got quiet, right? We're talking about food. We're talking about eating. This is important. All right? Wednesday night meal will be in here because we're setting up for the fall festival over there, okay, so um, make note when, 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 we, when you come for that. We notice what's on the front here. These are our Operation Christmas Child gift boxes, and they are ready for pickup. This is uh, something that we do every Christmas season. It's time to start getting ready to send the boxes wherever they're going to go in the world for Operation Christmas Child, an opportunity to bless children around the world, opportunity to present the gospel. Each box already has the little label and booklet in it, uh, so it's your choice as to whether you pack a girl's box or a boy's box and the age for that uh, particular box. So if, if, if you'll pick those up today, take them with you, start building your boxes, uh, wrap them, fill the box up, put a couple of rubber bands around it, and bring them back, and we will uh, dedicate them on November the 24th and we'll make sure that they get to the distribution points, get to get, get packed up, and uh, they'll be sent around the world. So Operation Christmas Child boxes are here. Pick them up at the end of the service. Okay, I'm glad you're here. Any prayer requests this morning? <coughs> Anything God's doing good in your life? Yes, yeah, well. right. Where are they at? Where are they at? There they are. Okay, and... Did you really? All right, congratulations. Congratulations. That's great. Glad to hear it. Okay, any other praises? All right, any prayer requests for the, for the group this morning that we can, we can pray about? Lots of things going on in people's lives, and we certainly want to remember those things. Yes, ma'am. Okay, D Deshaun, Deshaun family, okay, all right. Anyone else? All right. I heard what? Oh, Linda, Linda Offer, yeah, uh, Jimmy's wife, yeah, Linda. We've been, Jimmy, we've been getting good reports, is that right? That's, that, we're, we're going to take that as a good report. So, okay, all right. Okay, let's begin then this morning. We'll take these things to the Lord and we'll begin our time of worship. Father, we thank you that you love us and that you care for us and that we can bring our needs and our concerns to you. And we, and we thank you, Lord, that we can lift up these folks that are in need of prayer where we're healing is uh, uh, desired, Lord. We pray that you would heal where encouragement is needed, Lord, where discouragement is going on, where battles are being fought in the lives of our people and temptation and defeat. And Lord, I, we pray that, that, that we would uh, see victory in those areas. For victories that are taking place in, the, in our folks' lives, Lord, we praise you for that and your, your, your presence in their life. We thank you, Lord, and we give you uh, honor and glory. May everything we do this morning be honoring and pleasing to you as we lift high the name of Jesus during this time of worship. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's stand as we worship and sing. I will sing, I will sing. I will sing, I will sing a song unto the Lord. I will sing, I will sing a song unto the Lord. I will sing, I will sing a song unto the Lord. Hallelujah, glory to 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 the Lord. Hallelujah, glory to
precious Redeemer ran, ran. Who would have thought that our land would rescue the souls of men? Oh, would rescue the souls of men? Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit belong to
Father, we praise your name that you provide us with what we need when we need it. You give us grace. Grace being the opportunity and the power and the desire to do your will and live godly for you. We thank you, Lord, that that grace is sufficient. It is sufficient to meet the needs that we have. We praise you for that this morning and thank you for loving us and giving us the ability to live a life that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right. How about our worship team? Aren't they, don't they do, I thought they do a good job. I mean, they really do. Thank you, guys. We're going to be getting on our bikes and riding a little bit this morning. So if you have your Bibles, I really encourage you to get them out and uh, follow along. We're going to try to project the scriptures that we're going to be looking at this morning on the screen. We're having some technology problem, but Rodney, you think, you think we got it back there, buddy? All right, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm wanting to continue this morning in, in a series of messages uh, called Spiritual Realities. These are, these are things that exist in the life of the believer. And so just by way of review, we, we've talked about some of these, that we're dead to sin, that we possess everything we need to live our life and live it in a godly fashion, things like that. that the, these are things that are statements that the Bible makes that if you just look at them at face value are pretty incredible statements. In fact, they are, they are so incredible that if they're not true, then, uh, then we really uh, can't rely on what Scripture says because they, they, are, they, are, they are emphatic statements of truth. And what they boil down to is, is that these things are, that, that God says actually exist. So what is a spiritual reality? This is just by, by way of review very quickly. A spiritual reality, these are blessings given at the moment of salvation. The moment that we become a Christian and the Spirit of God indwells us, the Spirit of God makes alive our dead spirit that is dead to the things of God, then, they come, then these realities come into existence. They exist regardless of whether we are consciously aware of them or not. That's an important fact. The realities exist whether we are consciously aware of them or not. We experience these realities when they are exercised by faith. So they have to be exercised. They have to be recognized and exercised. And when we exercise them, that produces spiritual growth. We talk a lot about growing spiritually. We talk a lot about it. We don't talk a lot about how to do it. And we certainly don't put into practice practicing these spiritual realities. But that's, but that's what a spiritual reality is. This morning, I want to talk about another spiritual reality that we're going to eventually get to. Uh, but, but, I, but I need to create a little bit of context, okay, for us so that we understand what the reality that we're talking about this morning is. So we're, we're going to start off about, uh, about the, uh, the title is The War We Fight. That's, that's not the spiritual reality. Well, it is a spiritual reality because we, we, we do fight a spiritual battle. But, I'm, but I want to create some, some context. One of the problems that we have uh, in living in the uh, relativistic, intellectual culture that we live in, we try to intellectualize everything and we try to rationalize everything and we want to have a firm handle intellectually everything so that we can control and understand the world in which we live. And so the result of that is that we tend to look at life and experiences in bits and pieces. When we talk about Christian worldview, the reason that we have believers this morning all over America, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if, with, if within the body of Christ that is Ozon Hill Baptist Church gathered this morning, most of the congregation, most of you this morning, are professing Christians. But it is highly likely that many of us this morning really do not possess a biblical worldview. Our worldview is, is 
filtered by the culture and the, and the experiences that are, uh, we are bombarded with all around. And what happens is, is that we, 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 we pick out battles, we pick out things, we pick out political issues between the left and the right, and we get mad, with it, depending on where you stand, left or right. And we, and, and, we, and we focus on that bit and piece of the world. We talk about homosexual agenda. We talk about abortion. We talk about uh, uh, these, these moral issues. And we, and we get all hot and bothered. And I'm not saying we shouldn't get hot and bothered. I'm just saying is that we focus on bits and pieces of the fight. Bits and pieces of the battle, of the war that we're in. We, will, we would intellectually say in a sense that, yes, we are in a spiritual battle. W- would you agree with that? I mean, we talk about it enough. But when we start focusing on the battle and on the things, we tend to focus on bits and pieces. To, uh, to understand how we wield this battle, we need to take a broader picture of the nature of the war. The nature of of the warfare. So I want to start off this morning by giving us a little bit of a broader understanding of what I'm talking about when we're talking about spiritual warfare and the battles that we deal with, okay? We need to understand the war we fight. First off, this is an elongated sentence, okay? Understanding the war we fight. First off, it is a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 12 Hopefully we'll get that scripture up here in a minute. It is a spiritual battle. Ephesians 6, 12. We struggle not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces in heavenly realms. So the first thing we need to understand about this war that we fight is that it is a spiritual battle. It is not against flesh and blood. Flesh and blood is involved with it, but it is not against flesh and blood. Sometimes when I'm, when I'm doing marriage counseling and what have you, I, guess I get one, one of the spouses in there and they're complaining about the other spouse. They you just don't understand. You don't understand what she's like. You don't understand what he's like. And they begin to tell me all this litany of complaints that they have about the other one. And so I explain to them or tell them, I says, is your spouse the enemy? Yes. Don't you understand? Why do you think I'm here? I need you to understand that my spouse is the enemy. I said, what if that's not true? Do you understand? You need to understand that first off, your spouse who you are in conflict with is not the enemy. Is your spouse flesh and blood? Yes. Ephesians 4, or 6 says, we struggle not against flesh and blood. So that little bit of the war starts off with a distortion. We are in a spiritual battle. We are, we are battling between forces of God, forces of evil, spiritual forces in high places. It is a spiritual battle fought in a, with clear commanders using opposing forces. Spiritual battle fought with clear commanders Using opposing forces, Galatians five seventeen. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another so that you do not do what you want to do. All right, now Paul uses terminology that has physical terminology as well as um, symbolic or metaphorical terminology. He uses terms like spirit, soul, flesh. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul is praying for these, th- these, first th- these Thessalonian Christians, and he says, my prayer for you is that your entire spirit, soul, and body be sanctified through and through. So he is talking about the, 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 what, what makes up being human, what makes up being a part of being a, a person, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is that part of, in us that is made alive 
When Jesus saves us and our spirit is quickened, it is made alive, it was dead to the things of God, it could not understand the things of God. First Corinthians says, the man without the spirit of God cannot understand the things of God. They are foolishness to him because these things of of God are spiritually discerned. So we have a spirit, a spirit that has been made alive in Christ. We have a leg up on living in this world that the lost world does not have. We have the spirit of God living inside of us because he has made alive our spirit. Then we have the soul. Greek word there is suke. Two words, you've heard me say this, two words in the New Testament are translated for this aspect of, of human nature. One is the Greek word suke. In the English, it is usually translated as soul. The other is nous, and it is usually translated in the English as mind. Now, what, now the way I like to describe that is that the soul is the kind of the cont- now, you know, this is this is for explanation purposes only. This is not a theological. I mean, the soul is sort of the container of the mind, the will, and the emotions. How I think how I choose and behave, how I feel. It's sort of the container. The noose, the mind, is the function of the mind, the will, and the emotion. It is describing the part of the human being that is basically the same thing. It is the part of us that thinks, it feels, and behaves, and chooses to do things. So Paul says, I pray that your spirit, the part of you that has been made alive in Christ Jesus, the part of you in which God dwells, if you are a Christian, your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and how all of that works, and your flesh, your body. Now, Paul uses flesh in several ways. One of it is the physical body in which we live. All right? we, 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 we have this, this physical body that we have that, that, that allows us to interact with God's creation, it allows us to interact in, in reality in the world, and we have thoughts about that, what goes on in this body. We have choices and will that ha- <coughs> causes us to function in this body. We have, we have emotions, but we have a physical body. But Paul also uses the flesh to describe our lower nature or our sinful nature. Now, we all know that we have a sinful nature. If you've been, been, been in church for any length of time, you have heard teaching about our sinful nature that does not go out of existence simply because we get saved. You might not have heard that so much. Our lower nature, our sinful nature, the part of us that, that, that defies God and struggles with pleasing God doesn't go out of existence simply because we get saved. But Paul says, I am praying for you that your spirit, the part of you that has been reborn and made alive in Christ, your mind, your will and emotions, your soul, and your body and your flesh, be sanctified through and through so that we may function the way God intends us to function. So, spiritual warfare is a spiritual battle fought with clear commanders. The commander of our spirit is who? 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 The commander of our spirit is who? Jesus. The commander of our flesh is who? Satan. The devil. God impacts us, prompts us, moves in us, and it begins through our spirit. The spirit of God bears witness with my spirit that this is God's doing and he wants us, this is what we want us to do. That's how God communicates with us first is through our spirit. Now he uses the word of God. He uses, he uses uh, prayer. He uses obedience. He uses fellowship. Those are all functions of the soul, people. They're not functions of our spirit. They're functions of our soul. So God communicates and functions in us through our spirit. But old devil, he attacks us and has, has access to us through our flesh. That's what Galatians 5.17 says. So this war is fought with clear commanders, the Lord Jesus Christ and the devil, using opposing forces, God's spirit and the temptations of the devil. So this battle is a spiritual battle fought with clear commanders using opposing forces on a specific 
battlefield. Now we have the spirit, our spirit with God's spirit. We have the flesh, the devil tempting us through our flesh and lower nature. So what's the battlefield? The battlefield is our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. Look at 2 Peter 2.11. It says it specifically. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to to abstain from sinful desires. Sinful desires is a function of my what? My flesh. To abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your what? Soul. Whoa. The word soul there is the Greek word suke. The functions of our flesh, the, the, the tendencies toward our flesh, the weaknesses of our flesh that Satan has access to through his temptations and his deceptions and his wiles, we're to fight that because the battlefield is where? In our soul. How we think, how we feel, and how we behave and choose. People come to me for counseling and they, Brother Dave, I got a spiritual problem. My soul, that's serious. Let's talk about that. And they begin to tell me whatever the problem is. And I will ask them, Are you a Christian? Has there ever been a time in your life when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes? Tell me about that. And they give me their testimony, they give me their experience with Christ. If we conclude that, yes, in fact, this person is, in fact, a believer, then I tell them. I say, well, then, based on your testimony of your faith in Christ, you don't have a spiritual problem. Your spirit's fine. <laughs> okay? Your spirit has been made alive in Christ. It couldn't get much better than that. Your spirit, because Christ lives there, has access to the spirit of God, and he has access to you, and and. and he prompts you and teaches you and shows you and gives you the ability through his grace to function. What you're describing, everything that you're describing as your spiritual problem is a function of your mind, your will, or your emotions. Everything. The battlefield is a specific battlefield fought between two opposing forces with clear commanders and it's a spiritual battle. So, this war we face is a spiritual battle. It's fought with clear commanders using opposing forces on a specific battlefield for the capture of vital objectives. I'm an old army guy. How many of you guys are veterans, guys and girls? Anybody serving a combat arm? Infantry, artillery, armor, air defense artillery? Okay. These are terms that are actually military terms. If you've ever been in the military and you understand objectives, you don't win the war the first day, usually. There's a series of battles, there's a whole series of battles that take place, and the battles are broken down into specific objectives. Anybody seen the movie Heartbreak Ridge? Heartbreak Ridge? About uh, Desmond Doss? A conscientious objector, a guy that would not refuse to carry a weapon, but was determined to serve in the army. He was granted that, and so he served as a medic. In the Battle of Okinawa, 1945, the objective was a place called Heartbreak Ridge on the battle on the island of Okinawa. It was a key defensive line of the Japanese. And it was a tough nut to crack. The Marines had to scale this thing and do frontal assaults. There wasn't any way to flank them or bomb them. And the Japanese were all entrenched in tunnels and caves and things. And they would plaster the place with artillery. And they'd get up there and they'd jump out of the holes and you'd have this pitched battle. His unit got up on top of that thing and was pushed off by a counterattack of the Japanese. And Doss was left stranded up there with over a hundred wounded American GIs. The, the battalion had been pushed off of the ridge. So they were up there by themselves, defenseless, most of them wounded. Desmond Doss was a Christian. He personally 
rescued 75 wounded soldiers, got them down off the ridge by lowering them down on a rope over, over the cliff. And his prayer was, after, you know, as total exhaustion set in, Lord, just give me one more. Lord, just give me one more. Lord, just give me one more. Got the Medal of Honor for it. If you go to the World War II Museum today and you go through the, the uh, museum there, you'll see the story of Desmond Doss. Objectives. Clear objectives. You don't win a war without fighting battles. You don't fight battles by just, let's go out there and have a battle. They're, they are intended to achieve and capture and attain certain objectives. So in this war that we have going on uh, between us and the forces of evil, what are the primary objectives? There are two words that really are pretty interesting. First is in Ephesians 4, 27. It's just a little phrase. It says, do not give the devil a foothold. It's in a whole series of things. We could spend an entire sermon, if not more, on Ephesians 4, about, having to, about have, living the Christian life. But it says, do not give the devil a foothold. The word foothold there is the Greek word topos. It's where we get the English word topography from. Foothold, what does that mean? It means territory. It means a place, literally. It means a, a place a territory, a jurisdiction. If, if I am in control of a, of a topos, I have jurisdiction over that place. It is territory. Now, Paul is describing that, that we can give the enemy, Satan coming to us through our flesh, we can give them territory in our soul. We can, we can allow him to occupy certain aspects of our mind, our will, or influence, <coughs> certain aspects of our mind, our will, and our emotions. And when we do that, he sets up camp, he sets up a fire team, he sets up a, 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 a presence or a, a, an influence in that foothold. And we are weakened at that point. If we don't recognize the territory, if we don't recognize that there's been a, a, a function of, within our mind, our will, and our emotions that are, that are susceptible to attack by Satan, then we have given him a foothold in our soul. So there are footholds that can happen to the Christian that makes us susceptible and easy prey. Do you have areas of your life where you know that you consistently fall short of what God wants you to do, where you consistently fail? Does that go on in your life? Then there is a topos in your mind, will, and emotions. There's a foothold because you're susceptible to it. If you weren't susceptible to it, you wouldn't keep falling for it every time, and neither would I. So we have territory. We have place. We have topos. And then in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, and 5, we talk about another type of objective. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. A stronghold literally is a fortress. It is a place that has been built up and is, is now fortified and it, uh, and it resists, it resists attack. The whole point of a fort is to build a strong point, a strong point that the, that the, that the attacker has to deal with if they're going to attain and, and move ahead in the objective. In the old days, they built big stone castles and entrenchments and all kinds of things. Now they are more mobile in modern warfare. They're mobile, but they're called strong points. And, um, but they, they function the same way. It takes a whole lot more effort in war to capture a fortress or a strong, or a strong point than it does to capture a pillbox or a foothold. So there are, there are footholds and there are strong points. So this, this war that we, that we are engaged in is a spiritual battle fought with clear commanders using opposing forces on specific battlefield, our soul, for the capture, capture of vital objectives within our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. Footholes, strongholds. The last thing about this war is that it uses identifiable weapons. It uses identifiable weapons. So this, to, to give you a, a bigger picture of the definition of the spiritual battle that we are in, 
The war is a spiritual battle fought with clear commanders using opposing forces on a specific battlefield to capture vital objectives using identifiable weapons. That's the larger perspective of the battle we're in to live a life that's pleasing to God in this world that is beset by the fall of sin. So what's the spiritual reality that I want to point out? I want to talk about weapons today. The weapons of our warfare. Now, we're going to have to continue this next Sunday because we just can't cover the whole thing in, you know... I want, I want to give you a, the reality of that our weapons that we have. The Satan has weapons. We're going to talk about that a little bit next week. I don't want to spend all our time talking about the weapons that Satan uses. I want to spend most of our time next Sunday talking about the weapons that we use. Okay? All right. But, that, but, but you, need, you need to know the, the nature of our weapons. Okay? And this is in 2 Corinthians 4, 10, 4, and 5. So what, what, are the, what is the nature of the weapons of our warfare? Paul says the weapons of our warfare, let's go back to four. The weapons of our warfare are not the weapons of the world. Now, literally, that's, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly in nature. That, that's, that's the literal translation, but essentially he's saying are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power. That's the first key we need to understand. Divine power. The weapons we fight with are weapons that are of God's nature and are, and are backed and, and, and using the power of God himself. They have divine power. To do what? To tear down or demolish strongholds. What did we say a stronghold was? Stronghold is an, is an objective that Satan is wanting to establish in our life. It begins with footholds. So if, a, if, if the weapons of our warfare can demolish strongholds, what do you think it can do to a foothold? <laughs> it can take care of a foothold too, wouldn't you think? To demolish strongholds. They're powerful weapons. The second thing the weapons that we have can do is that they demolish arguments and pretensions. Now, this is, a, this is an interesting thing. First of all, it's a stronghold. Stronghold is something that, uh, that, it, that it is an objective that has been achieved by Satan in our soul, in our mind, will, and emotions. And the, 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 the power of our weapons that we have to use can demolish those things. They also demolish the temptations that come along with it. And Paul calls them arguments and pretensions. Um, the... Uh, Next, next uh, go, to, go, go to verse 5, uh, Brother Rodney. There you go. We demolish arguments and every pretension. All right, arguments and pretensions. First of all, arguments are reasonings, philosophies, sophisticated words. Old devil is pretty crafty about, about the stuff that he uses against us. He will array against us pretty, pretty good sounding stuff. His, to, to, try, to try to make us think that really we are really kind of naive as Christians. We, 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 we really are kind of dumb when it comes right down to it. We live in this Pollyanna world that everything is wonderful, everything is beautiful, and that we just sort of sail through life with this faith that gives us an unrealistic of what's really going on. That's an argument and a pretension. He's crafty. One of his weapons is to come in and say, did God really say that you shouldn't do that? Did God, and if you go back to Genesis, that's, 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 the, that's the argument and the pretension that Satan used against Adam, Adam and Eve in the garden. So the weapons that we have demolish those kinds of high sounding reasonings, philosophies, sophisticated words and pretensions. I like this word. And a, a pretension is a Greek word that means an, an elevated place. An elevated place. A pretension is somebody who is kind of, kind of irritating with his air of superiority. Have you ever met anybody like that? They, they you know, they 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 walk around just with, with kind of this. <clears throat> well, when it gets right down to it, Christian, you're just not very smart. I mean, after all, look at the world around you. 
this Pollyanna pie in the sky, sweet by and by stuff isn't really very smart. You guys are living in an unreal world. The reason, do you want to know the reason that I'm not a Christian? You want to know the reason that I'm an atheist? It's because it doesn't make any sense. All you have to do is look around. If God is the way that you describe him to me, I don't want him to be God because, I, because quite frankly, I think I'm smarter than he is anyway. It's that kind of stuff. Pri- it's fueled by pride. We're going to get into that next Sunday. We're going to get into the, 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 the areas that these weapons are used in. So, uh, the weapons of our warfare demolish that kind of stuff. And when we use it as a counter to the unbelieving, criticizing, making fun of stuff that we deal with in this world as we battle in it, our arguments, our weapons can demolish those things. Then the next one, I think, is one of the most remarkable statements of all. Because the weapons of our warfare, these are the spiritual realities. They have the power to destroy strongholds, to, 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 to demolish pretensions and arguments. And this one is one of the most incredible statements in Scripture. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. Now think about that for a second. Dave, are you trying to tell me that as a Christian, I can challenge and take captive every thought that comes into my pumpkin head Regardless of the source, I can take captive that thought and make it obedient to Christ? Well, that's what that says. Now, we get some weird thoughts in our head. It can come out of nowhere. I can be sitting there having a grand time. I was sitting on Jim Honey's tractor the other day. Having a marvelous time. It wasn't such a marvelous time. I was working hard. I was working on those burn piles that are out in my house trying to get rid of those things. And, and I was out there, and I was just working away. And, and suddenly, I began to feel anxious. I don't know why, but I recognized the anxiety. And what's go- Where'd that come from? I wasn't thinking about anything to be anxious about that I knew of. But I began to feel this oppression and this sense of fear and anxiety. And all I was doing was driving a tractor. The reality is, the spiritual reality is that the weapons that we fight with allows us to take captive any thought that comes. A thought, by the way, is a function of your soul. Remember that? Mind, will, and emotions, the thought. Satan has access to that through your flesh. And they can pop up. We can take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. That's why that I give out things called stop think cards. Stop think cards are little little business card size things that say stop on one side, think on the other. That's why we call them stop think cards. Clever, huh? And uh, on one side, it talks about an emotion, anxiety, fear, uh, uh, bitterness and anger, shame, guilt, grief, those kinds of things. And it says, when I'm thinking, when I'm feeling this, I'm thinking these kinds of thoughts. And it lists the kinds of thoughts that produce anger and guilt, and shame, and bitterness, and grief, those kinds of things. You can't have an emotion, a function of your soul, without there being a thought preceding it. Thoughts produce emotions. If you don't believe that, go look up a psychology 101 textbook in any university, and then that's what it'll, that's what it'll tell you. Now, the Bible tells you that already, but if you don't believe the Bible well enough, go look up in any psychology 101 book in college, and it will tell you that thoughts produce emotions. <laughs> okay? And that's why I'm talking about cognitive distortions and we talk about stuff, stuff like that. Yeah, cognitive distortion is a psychological term for believing a lie. Okay? And so, Satan has access through our flesh for, because our flesh is still influenced by the spirit lust against the flesh, the flesh against the spirit. They're contrary to one another. That You don't do what you want to do. Satan has access through our flesh to tempt us in our, on the battlefield, the mind, the will, and emotions. But that says that the weapons that we fight with, we can take captive any thought that is producing an emotion. Thoughts produce emotions. Emotions produce behavior, which starts the cycle all over again. 
That says that we can take captive anything that produces an emotion that is destructive or harmful or unpleasant and behavior that that emotion produces and make it obedient to Christ. Absolutely incredible statement. If that's true, that's a game changer for how we live our lives. So we are in a spiritual battle. We have weapons that are divine, has divine power, tear down strongholds, put down pretenses, and we can take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. The weapons of our warfare are sufficient, even superior to what Satan uses against us. The battle is real. Stakes are high. And Satan isn't playing games. We are fortunate in many ways to live where we live because we still have elements of a Christian culture around us that kind of kind of help us support our our lifestyle and those kinds of things. It's rapidly diminishing, but uh, we're still fortunate in that area. But if you're if you struggle with living godly, then you understand. Then you're experiencing spiritual warfare. You need to understand and, and apply. The truth concerning the warfare. Next Sunday we're going to get into more specifics. We're going to get into how to wield the weapons. (laughs) Again, like I said, we can't can't cover all this in one one sitting. But if you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with Christ, then a lot of this doesn't ring true with you. It may sound good, but it it doesn't ring true. You can accept Christ this morning. You can have the Spirit of God indwell you and begin to live in light of this reality because the battle is there. If you're here this morning without Christ, you've already lost. Satan already has you where he wants you. You may not be as bad as you can be, but you're as bad off as you can be because he has you where he wants you. If you're here this morning and you're a believer, time in your life when you accepted Christ as your Savior and you can recall that, then you're in a battle. Satan wants to neutralize you as much as he can. You need to understand where the battlefield is in your mind, your will, and your emotions. And if there has been objectives that have been attained by your flesh, your fleshly nature, that are contrary to what God would have you do, it's time to identify them and deal with them. We're going to have time of invitation. If you need, if you need Christ this morning, I'm going to ask the musicians to come on up. If you need Christ this morning, we can settle that issue right here and now. If you have issues in your life or areas in your life where footholds have been established in your soul, where strongholds have been established in your soul, be honest about that because there are ways to combat it. There are ways to win over it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you, Lord, for the clarity, the specific clarity of of what we're dealing with, trying to live in, the, in this world that is beset and is under the, under the curse of sin, and, and Satan is so active in the lives of unbelievers as well as trying to be active in the life of believers. I pray, Lord, this morning that we would search our hearts and that we would, we would respond in any way that you have pricked us to respond, either right where we're sitting using this Stage front as an altar of prayer. Lord, I pray, Lord, that we would be open and responsive to what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. If you have a decision to make this morning, you step right out on the first notes of the first verse.
let's be mindful of those who are still here at the front praying and uh, dealing with things. I uh, want to remind you that Wednesday night meal will be in the MLC on Wednesday night. We need to go ahead and pick the chairs up and put them away. We'll do the reset for Wednesday, and then we'll, that, that set will be what we will use for the uh, uh, Harvest Festival activities, meals, and activities also. So, is there any word from anybody that we need to know about? Children's workers? Well, they're off at, at doing rehearsals, so... <laughs> Uh, Dustin, you, you you have anything? Pick a box. Pick a box. Bug, we okay? What? Three. Three o'clock is when we begin to do it working on the sets for fall festival. All right. Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and this will send us on our way. Father, we thank you for loving us, for teaching us, and showing us in your Word just how clear. Uh, your will is and your desires for our life. May we take this out from this place to serve you better. In Jesus' name, amen.